Pakistan accused of gross incompetence and negligence, the US, of an act of war. A report into the killing of the world's most wanted man is leaked to Al Jazeera. So, who knew what in the hunt for Osama bin Laden? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Sami Zaydan. It was a military mission that humiliated Pakistan and strained relations with the US. Now, a report obtained by Al Jazeera's investigative unit is offering a scathing critique of the hunt for Osama bin Laden. Well, the Abbottabad Commission details the comprehensive failure of Pakistan to detect the presence of bin Laden for almost 10 years. It blames gross incompetence and negligence at almost every level of Pakistan's security. The Commission also criticizes Pakistan's leaders for failing to detect CIA activities on its soil. And it says it couldn't rule out that rogue Pakistani intelligence officials had shielded bin Laden. Well, the report is also critical of what it calls the illegal manner in which the U.S. conducted the raid on bin Laden's compound. It describes it as an American act of war and accuses the U.S. of acting like a criminal thug. Well, the CIA is also accused of failing to share information with Pakistan on bin Laden's whereabouts. To our discussion in a moment, at first, Josh Bernstein looks at U.S.-Pakistani relations in the build-up to bin Laden's death. The report focuses on the fact that the U.S. raid not only killed bin Laden, but also three Pakistani citizens while violating the nation's airspace. In Islamabad, leaders only learned about it on television. Not long after, there were protests across the country. U.S. Admiral Mike Mullen, the highest ranking military officer in the United States, only called Pakistan's chief of army staff at 5 a.m. the next morning, six hours after the raid began. The raid was the greatest humiliation visited upon the country since its breakup in 1971. Ever since the war in Afghanistan in 2001, Pakistan was always an unenthusiastic ally in what the U.S. called its war on terror. President Musharraf was enthusiastic, I think, primarily because he saw a way to get his country out of pariah status and the 10-year divorce it had with the United States. Uh, there were others, particularly ISI, which for 10 years had fostered a different policy. The U.S. became frustrated and planned to hunt for bin Laden alone, but for that, it needed access. According to the report, the U.S. turned to the Pakistani ambassador to the U.S., Hussein Haqqani. The report accuses Haqqani of providing hundreds of visas, which ultimately facilitated the unilateral manhunt for Osama bin Laden. That is something he strongly denies. During the uh, uh, meeting with the commission, uh, I very clearly pointed out to them that there was no unauthorized visa issued. And very frankly, I don't think the Navy SEALs came into Pakistan with visas issued by the Embassy of Pakistan in the United States. In the years after 2005, the relationship soured even further, with the U.S. accusing Pakistan of tipping off jihadists ahead of American raids. The report acknowledges a shortage of mutual appreciation, a lack of regard and trust in this contingent, transactional, and often resentful relationship. Yeah, I think uh, there's every reason not to have trust uh, from their point of view, for historical reasons, from our point of view, as we find it very difficult to understand how they can consort with the Talibs who are killing Americans. By 2011, the U.S. was regularly conducting drone operations within Pakistan. The report says the buildup of U.S. aggressiveness and hostility were noted, but their policy implications were not dealt with seriously. And in the run-up to the raid itself, explicit threats were communicated by Barack Obama, but all of them were either ignored or discounted. This was a massive and irresponsible lack of due diligence. The report paints a picture of Pakistan as manipulated and undermined by the U.S. Pakistan's spy chief says the nation had become too weak and dependent to defend itself against U.S. policies. And none of the other political, security, and intelligence agencies had the knowledge, the will, or the authority to combat the spread of the CIA's tentacles all over the country. Today, the U.S. drones still fly over Pakistan. Relations are at a low, but still, a key question of the report remains unanswered. 
What is Pakistan's policy when it's threatened by a superpower like the U.S.? Plenty to discuss then with our guests in our Washington studios. Robert Grenier, he served as the CIA's top counterterrorism official and as a CIA station chief in Islamabad. Joining us from Islamabad is Talad Masoud. He's a retired Pakistani army general and now a defense analyst. And here in Doha, we have Phil Rees from Al Jazeera's investigative unit. He's been studying the report. Welcome to you all. If I could start with Phil, we've got to ask the question, first of all, you've looked at this report. When you look at the authors, when you look at the sources, is it credible? Is it reliable? It's very credible and very reliable. Um, I think it's, it's evidence that there is a sort of independent body of people that do exist. Um, one of them is a, a, a chief justice, one of them is a, a retired soldier. I think that the report shows remarkable independence. All right, uh, Robert Grenier, where does this report leave suspicions that uh, you know, people have had that whether Pakistan was officially or, or state institutions were trying to hide bin Laden or uh, sort of colluding in the hiding of bin Laden? I think the authors of the report are quite careful uh, not to state definitively things that they cannot know definitively. And so, as was mentioned in the, uh, the earlier comments, they, they say they can't exclude the possibility that there were some officials who were knowledgeable, at least on an unofficial basis, if you will. Uh, but they, they leave us in no doubt that they certainly don't believe that there was any sort of official collusion on the part of Pakistani authorities. And is that where U.S. Laden. intelligence they, they assessments stand at this point? They can't exclude it as a possibility, but they, they can cite no evidence for it. Is that where U.S. intelligence estimates stand at this point? Oh, well, I, I don't know what uh, official U.S. intelligence estimates are, but uh, as, uh, as an, an informed observer, uh, I never thought that there was official Pakistani collusion, even at the time of the raid. Okay, perhaps we'll bring in Talat Masood. What sort of picture is now emerging about life for bin Laden on the, on the run and, and during the, the 10 years, in, almost 10 years, in which he was in Pakistan? Well, he was uh, seemed to be moving initially from one place to the other. He made uh, more or less about four stops uh, before he really settled in Aftabad. And there, I think he was there. So overall, uh, he stayed for over nine years, as you said. And um, he seemed to be reasonably comfortable. He thought that uh, he would never be detected. And um, obviously, you know, many questions do arise. And I think the report is very clear on that, uh, that uh, there seems to be uh, some sort of a high level of incompetence, but uh, there is uh, no complicity as far as uh, the Pakistan government or intelligence agencies or the military were concerned. So I think that aspect is fairly clear. Uh, but uh, the question is that they haven't come to any conclusion as far as that aspect is concerned. They have left it a little vague, uh, because after all, how did then the Americans came to know uh, as to uh, where Osama was residing and how did they then uh, go through the whole exercise of raiding and violating Pakistan's space and uh, capturing Osama bin Laden and killing him. Uh, Phil Reese, uh, there is a bit of sarcasm in the report when it talks about, um, you know, the role of Pakistani institutions in this. Where, where does that sarcasm, I guess, leave the suspicions that perhaps individuals colluded in an un official capacity with bin Laden's support network? Well, the report concludes that there must have been a support network, a Pakistani support network, which is outside of the people in the house, that is the two brothers who were primarily helping him and indeed um, his son who is there. So the question is, who were they? Now, <laughs> you said sarcasm. That section reeks with irony, almost disbelief as to how could the intelligence agencies, which are all powerful, the inter-services intelligence directorate is, is feared throughout Pakistan. It is the only real functioning institution. Yet, uh, when it comes to this, it seems to be incredibly ignorant and seems to be completely asleep on the job. And I think that the report does lay open the possibility of complicity. It admits that it's beyond its brief to be able to find that. It's incapable of finding it. Um, but it certainly 
keeps the door ajar, that there is complicity at some level. Now, where that level is, we don't know. But I spoke to defense analysis in Pakistan over the past few days. That couldn't be just some junior guy at the local station. It had to be at a relatively senior level. All right, Talat Masood, I mean, how do you assess the answer to that question? The question of just how they could be such a large scale of incompetence as painted uh, by this report at all levels of the Pakistani authorities? Well, I would say that uh, there is no doubt about it that there has been huge incompetence. And this is the first time that the um, report, which consisted of members, um, of the Commission, who are really a part of, uh, or at least were a part of the establishment, first time criticizing the establishment in a way that they did. But when it came to um, collusion, uh, they have left that, you know, chapter somewhat open. And my own view is that there was no collusion as far as I could make out. And uh, I, even, even on, uh, in terms sort of, of on an quite... individual level, no, no, yeah, I'm coming to that. But it's very much possible that there was some sort of a collusion uh, at the, you know, um, uh, field level, uh, at the, uh, you know, local level. And it could also be not only with the, uh, say, intelligence agencies or detachment, or it could also well be with the local authorities there, uh, and it could be a combination of both. And the motivation for that could be financial. The motivation could be uh, financial as well as ideological uh, among the people who were supportive of Osama. <clears throat> All right, Robert Grenier, how much has been learned since the killing of Osama bin Laden about the support network for him? Well, it, actually, not very much. And uh, w what's interesting is that in all of this trove of, of information, uh, computers, thumb drives, uh, all sorts of electronic media, as well as, um, as documents that were seized from the site by the, the, uh, the SEALs and that were subsequently analyzed, uh, a fair amount of which, uh, perhaps a surprising amount of which, has actually been divulged publicly. There is nothing in all that information that I'm aware of uh, which indicates the, either collusion on the part of, uh, of Pakistani officials, officially or unofficially, uh, nor does it suggest that, that there was an extensive Pakistani network. Now, obviously, the, the members of the, the commission in their report uh, indicate that there are some things that they don't know. Uh, but for in, in light of all of this speculation about you know, large support networks and, and some sort of official involvement, uh, the, the authors of the report can cite no evidence for that other than uh, simply uh, simply sp speculating. And so I, I think, quite frankly, this is, this is the weakest part of the report. Let me just interject one other aspect here. And this is something which is suggested, uh, but to my knowledge, not stated in the report. And that is that it, it seems to me, at least, that, that one of the main reasons why Pakistani officials were not able to find bin Laden is because, quite frankly, they did not want to find bin Laden. There were not active efforts made. In fact, it states in the report that there were not active official efforts made to try to track down bin Laden uh, outside of the context of U.S. Why do you think that was the case, Mr. Grenier? Uh, my my view is that uh, bin Laden was in an entirely different category. Uh, there was very effective cooperation between the ISI and the CIA in tracking down uh, many members, including very senior members of Al Qaeda. But uh, bin Laden was unique in terms of his political impact and the sensitivity surrounding him. And I think that it was it was anticipated by Pakistani officials that if they were to capture him and turn him over that uh, this would create something of a political firestorm. Uh, frankly, I, I think that they were, they were hoping that he would never come to light when, uh, I know when General Musharraf would be asked about it in public, he would say, no, 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 we don't think he's in our country at all. He, he must be somewhere in Afghanistan. I, I think they, they were simply hoping that the problem would go away. Talat Masood, do you agree with that? In a sense, perhaps he was too much of a hot potato. Well, I would uh, very much agree with him, and I think uh, what also happened is they thought probably if at all he is even here, firstly, they never thought that he was here, but if he was here, then I think they th thought that he was mostly ineffective, and in any case, we should go for those uh, who are more important in the sense that they are at the moment operational as far as insurgency but and But what Mr. Grenier seems concerned. to be suggesting uh, so is it would be too, too politically embarrassing to find him in Pakistan and present I, I, the problem I, I, of what to do with him. I, I, so, yeah, absolutely. So that I agree with him that it would be. But on the contrary, I also have another view about it. 
Look, if uh, Pakistan high ups knew where he was, then surely uh, it would have been, uh, they could have taken all the credit and Pakistan would then have been a darling of the U.S. and the West, that uh, you know, Osama, the icon of terrorism, uh, has been captured by Pakistan and handed over. But th this they could have also done very subtly, giving an impression as though they were not truly totally responsible for it, uh, not okay, to take okay. the backlash of Okay, I can see Phil Reese is shaking his head <laughs> and wants to get into this discussion. Go ahead, Phil. Well, I think there's another uh, interpretation of what Robert Grenier and General Massoud have said. Of course he was a hot potato. He was a massive hot potato. Um, the instinct of the ISI, therefore, is not to simply turn its back and think, well, we're not going to do anything about this. You know, their energy would be directed to make sure that he was kept quiet. And perhaps he was kept there. And, you know, this is, of course, speculation. I mean, the report does not say this. But believe me, it hints at it. I think if you look at the quotes when he said how lucky bin Laden was that every institution, including the ISI, was looking the other way and all this. Well, I mean, the truth is that perhaps he was a bargaining chip. But we know the involvement of the Inter-Services Intelligence Agency with the Taliban. They've got the number two they picked up there. We know what's going on in Afghanistan. We know the popularity of bin Laden in P Pakistan. Um, for them to hand him over to the United States, I think, would have been politically too much of a time bomb for them to deal with, for either the civil or the military institutions there, to be honest with you. So if they did know what it, then they had him there, what are they going to do with him? Send him to Guantanamo to civil trial? I mean, the, the whole complexities of what would happen was too much. So yes, they did want to look the other way, but I think they deliberately did. All right, Phil, though, if we could shift gears a little bit. Let's talk about the implications of this report for Pakistan today, particularly Pakistani institutions. Do you think it's going to prompt some kind of massive reform or review of how things work in the country? Well, in terms of sort of concrete evidence and, you know, a lot of what we've just said, of course, is speculation. Um, that is the most damning and embarrassing part of it. It shows a civilian government that basically doesn't care. I mean, the defense minister um, never talked to the ISI at all, and he's meant to be their boss, by the way. Um, it showed a civilian leadership that had no idea what was going on and was simply there to basically cream their pockets. It doesn't put it in quite to such direct terms, but that's implied. Now, I mean, I think that it's laid bare, something that many of us had observed before, and I think that this is the question now. Is there a, a, a civil and a part of the establishment, and as we, as General Massoud mentioned, the, the authors of the report are part of the establishment, but they're away from the traditional two parties who've governed Pakistan, like sort of almost, if I can say, like, like sort of a mafia state. So they've, they, they're able to sort of look at this, and we've seen with the growth of the judiciary as well, they're exercising its power in recent years. Uh, perhaps we're seeing within the establishment and within the elite a kind of civil society which is not going to accept the kind of faux democracy that Pakistan has had in, in, over the past three or four you know, decades. That is, even, right. even when the military wasn't let, ruling let me directly. Bring, let me bring General Masood back into this. You, of course, you've served in the Pakistani military. Oh, I'm wondering what you think when you read parts of the report that say that if a similar raid was to occur again, for example, Pakistan would be unable to prevent it. I mean, there must be parts of this report that make your skin cringe. Absolutely, because, you know, there is so much of investment and resources that have been going into the military and uh, the image that the military and the intelligence have in Pakistan, to a large extent, it did suffer uh, a very serious damage as a result of all this. And people then started asking questions. But uh, nonetheless, uh, they realized that uh, obviously Americans can still violate uh, the uh, airspace and get away with it because of their superior technology and also the fact that Pakistan, truly speaking at that time, was not looking to the West and had left that border more or less undefended. Uh, that excuse probably they would buy for a while. But now that this uh, act took place, and especially the way that the border is hostile now, the western border, Pakistan is in a trap in a way. Both the eastern and the western borders need to be defended. And does it have the resources? And does it have the support of the international community? And if its allies are the ones which are going to violate its sovereignty, both through drones and through such acts as we saw um, you know, in Osama bin Laden's raid, then what sort of expectations there are both from the government and the allies? Let's talk a little bit more about that, Robert Granier. Where does this report leave suspicions
of private Pakistani collusion with uh, U.S. policy that's sometimes called a violation of Pakistani sovereignty? Well, again, you, you would expect that um, uh, people responsible for air defense, uh, the, the Pakistani Air Force and others would be quite defensive, and I think they were quite defensive when they were interviewed by the members of the commission. Uh, and yet, I, I think that you know, the, the story which has come through, which, which says that they, they simply did not have, A, they were not expecting uh, an air intrusion from the West. The, yes, the, the Western border is problematic, but it's problematic because of, of militants on the ground, not because of uh, expected uh, incursions uh, from the air and certainly not uh, by a, a Western superpower. Uh, so I, I think that their explanations for why they were unable to, uh, to detect this military activity uh, do ring true, and I, I think that they're understandable. Needless to say that uh, there are probably some things that would have to change in, uh, in the future. So I, I really don't see any evidence for any sort of official collusion or turning a blind eye uh, to, what, uh, to what the Americans were doing. I think that uh, the, the Pakistan military uh, was genuinely surprised well, let, let, me, let me ask you this question, though, Mr. Gurney. You've served with the CIA and you've served in Islamabad. The sort of picture that's painted here in the report about, well, I guess you could call it some kind of support base for the CIA, CIA in Pakistan. Is that accurate? When you talk about a support base for the CIA in, in Pakistan, but you, again, you're talking about uh, some sort of an independent CIA network. So I want to make sure I, right. I understand what, what yes, you're referring to. Yes, operating outside of uh, the control of the the Pakistani government, implicated, uh, or oh, there's a hint at implication in, in setting up the raid that killed Osama bin Laden. There are names mentioned associated with intelligence, Pakistani intelligence figures. I mean, it does look like there is some kind of CIA. A network in the country. Well, certainly, that, that's always possible, and and that's what uh, uh, international uh, spy agencies are are charged with doing. Now, needless to say, you know that the, the uh, U.S. Uh, policy and U.S. intelligence has been best served, I think, by its cooperation. Uh, with the ISI, and I think that we can point to a, a great many successes that, that have occurred and that, that uh, have redounded uh, to the credit of, uh, of both countries. Uh, that said, I certainly, certainly don't exclude the possibility that there was some uh, independent ac activity going on. Although I will say that um, I think within the report, where they're talking about things that are relatively unknown, I think that the report's authors allow themselves to speculate a little bit wildly. Uh, reference to hundreds of visas that, that were issued, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I think the reason that there were lots of, large numbers of, ish, of visas that were issued for uh, American officials coming in and out of Pakistan was because, uh, yes, there were a significant number of people who needed to be there in order to uh, cooperate with Pakistani authorities, and also they tended to come for very short periods of time. So uh, over time, yes, you had a great many people who were coming and going, but I think that the aspect uh, of that is, uh, seems far more sinister than, in fact, it is. Okay, let me bring Phil Rees to weigh in on this. Like I said, you've, you've gone through this very carefully. What's your take on it? Well, I mean, I quote you here the um, Director General of the ISI at the time. Um, he said that he had a, quote, political understanding with America over their use of drones, uh, though nothing was in writing. And this echoes what the Foreign Minister at the time as well said, that certain agreements had been made, but nothing in writing. Uh, so nobody could be accused of something afterwards. So what it suggests is that there is this backhanded relationship going on. Quite frankly, the Pakistani population would be extremely angry to know of this. So there's no transparency in terms of the U.S. relationship with Pakistan. It suits neither side. Um, and therefore, when it comes to the ISI again, either this feared powerful, extremely well-funded um, agency um, is again, you know, quite frankly stupid and unable to spot, you know, quite a lot of CIA activity around it, um, or there, is, there might be some kind of collusion at some level. And indeed, it's one of its own former members, um, Colonel uh, Said Iqbal, um, who was involved in taking pictures around the place there. He was on a house claiming to take pictures of dogs. In fact, um, you know, there was a neighbor's house. You could see the compound. And now he's disappeared. Um, and the report suggests that obviously he was a um, CIA man. So clearly, you know, the CIA has been doing its job. but. I think the question that is unanswered is how much some elements of the ISI may have known about that as well. So a lot of questions still to be answered, but for now we'll have to leave the discussion there. Let's thank our guests, Robert Grenier, Talat Massoud and Phil Rees.
And don't forget, you can find this show and many more at aljazeera.com. Just follow the link for shows. And also at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. Why not leave us your comments there too? Thanks for watching. Goodbye for now.